This is Keith Thompson of Exegetical Apologetics. That's the name of my new website. That's where I'll be posting my articles and videos from now on. This is a response to Muslim apologist Ijaz Ahmed's video, Introduction to the New Testament, Part 1. Because of all the errors of fact and distortions, I feel a rebuttal is in order. Ahmed's aim was to disparage the New Testament documents and the Christian message with many sweeping assertions and outright falsehoods. Ahmed begins with some assertions regarding New Testament authorship. He claims, The New Testament's primary authors are anonymous, which means that they are unknown. Homonymous, which means that they use the names of other people, common names, similar names. And some scholars believe in one specific case, the case of Paul, that uh, he narrated his letters to ascribe what we call an amanuensis. So through church tradition, we've been told that the Gospels were written by four historic individuals, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, this information comes from the late second century. Now, there are many problems with this compact paragraph of assertions. Ahmed's claim the primary New Testament authors are anonymous is incorrect. Paul is a primary author and is not anonymous. He names himself as the author in his letter greetings. Moreover, he even names his amanuensis Tertius in Romans 16.22 so that amanuensis is not anonymous either. So the way Ahmed formulated his comments is incorrect. As for the Gospels, he did not interact with Richard Bauckham's argument that Mark used the common literary device known as inclusio of eyewitness testimony in order to show that Peter was the eyewitness ultimately behind the work, so that in essence Peter used Mark as his amanuensis. That Mark functioned as an amanuensis of Peter is also confirmed by the work of Jung Yoon Moon, who in his 2008 doctoral dissertation persuasively argued that Mark was likewise the amanuensis for parts of the epistle 1 Peter. Also contained in Mark's gospel is the plural to singular device. The way this device worked was Mark modified original first person plural verbs from eyewitness recollections of Peter, turning them into third person plural verbs for his gospel, which appear more unnatural in the Greek. We are therefore looking at the perspective of Peter when this device was used. Now, we know that Luke relied on Mark as a source for about 40% of his gospel. Yet, in his preface, Luke affirms his written narrative sources were composed by eyewitnesses. This is Luke's way of telling us that Mark was an eyewitness source, an affirmation cohering with our position that Mark is based on the eyewitness testimony of Peter. Ahmed's claim that Mark's gospel was only attributed to Mark in the late 2nd century is incorrect, as both Papias and Justin Martyr give evidence of Markan authorship or Peter's testimony being the basis of Mark's gospel. There is a growing consensus of scholars affirming that Papias wrote about AD 110 and many arguments for this position. Papias wrote that the way he knew Mark wrote canonical Mark based on Peter's eyewitness testimony was because traveling students of John the Elder informed him of this. And since in the same work, Papias confirmed John the Elder knew Jesus and the disciples, John the Elder was thus in a great position to accurately relay such authorship information. We therefore have testimony from John the Elder going back to the first century, confirming that Mark was written by Mark based on Peter's direct recollections. What about Papias's writings containing mentions of gigantic grape clusters? Doesn't this strange story undermine his reliability? Was Papias here passing this off as Jesus tradition? No. This teaching is traced to the Jewish works 2nd Baruch 29.5 and 1st Enoch 10.18-19. It is also found in the Apocalypse of Paul 22, without reference to it being Jesus tradition thereby helping to show that Papias was not representing it as Jesus' tradition either. Papias must have therefore learned this Jewish material and then used it as a way to explain or interpret Jesus' teachings as a sort of midrash. 
scholars convincingly posit Jesus' Matthew 26, 27-29 teaching on the millennium, which involved wine, to be the likely candidate. After all, Papias' work was called Sayings of the Lord Interpreted. Stephen Young therefore notes, quote, Understanding this material as commentary rather than tradition that goes back to Jesus would be in keeping with the nature of Papias' work, end quote. Hence, Papias was offering Medrashic commentary, not presenting this teaching as Jesus' tradition. What about Papias' strange-sounding teaching about Judas's fate, where he said, quote, His flesh was so bloated, he was not able to pass through a place where a wagon passes. Doesn't this ridiculous-sounding passage show that Papias was unreliable? No. The fact is, Shanks has shown these outrageous physical descriptions of Judas actually just represent a common ancient literary device of hyperbolically describing the downfall of the wicked. They were not to be taken literally. Concerning Justin Martyr's comments on Mark's Gospel, they're important as Justin lived between AD 103 to 165. In his work Dialogue with Trypho, he quoted Mark 3.17 mentioning Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Now, none of the other Gospels mention this, only Mark. So Mark's Gospel is clearly in view. In the immediate context, while referring to the same text, Justin then mentions Peter and his name change, quote, written in the memoirs of him, that is Peter, unquote. Thus, Justin knew of Mark's Gospel and attested the basis of it was Peter, so much so that it could be called Peter's memoirs, just as the other evidence confirms. Then after this, you have late 2nd century traditions and on, from Irenaeus, Tertullian, Hippolytus, Clement of Alexandria, the anti-Marcionite prologue to Mark, etc. But scholars note there are some different emphases in these patristic quotations, suggesting that we are dealing with multiple independent traditions, and the fact that no rival theories of this gospel's authorship are discussed or proposed in the early patristic literature is evidence the traditional authorship view advanced by them is factual and original. Now, confirming this patristic tradition that Mark wrote his gospel in Rome based on Peter's eyewitness testimony is the fact that 1 Peter 5.13 in the first century places both Peter and Mark together in Rome as close acquaintances. Philemon 1.24 likewise places Mark in Rome, and Acts 12.11-17 connects Mark and Peter, since there Peter visits Mark's home. So the patristic tradition is substantially strengthened by the first century material. Lastly, if we hold that Mark did not write his gospel, but instead just assert that the patristic idea he did is just a fictional invention, the question then arises as to why the early church would designate Mark as the author and not an actual eyewitness disciple like Andrew or Philip. On this basis, scholars note that we can conclude Markan authorship was not falsely concocted, but is instead reflective of historical truth. As one can see, it is easy for Ahmed to make sweeping, dismissive generalizations, but he has a lot of evidence to deal with. His claim only late 2nd century patristics affirm Mark in authorship is a blatant falsehood. The same kinds of arguments can be made for the other three Gospels as well. Ahmed did not deal with the internal and external evidence for the authorship of those works either. He did not address Papias' comments from AD 110 on Matthew being written by Matthew. And by the way, when Papias said Matthew composed sayings of Christ in the Hebrew dialecto, he did not refer to Hebrew language, as some critics assume. The Greek word was also used in a technical rhetorical sense with the meaning of Hebrew or Jewish rhetorical style. Scholars like Joseph Kurtzinger and Robert Gundry Therefore, note, Papias was saying Matthew was written with Hebrew rhetorical style, not in the Hebrew language. I can go in depth and prove this from the context. And the word dialecto here is anarthrous, i.e. lacking the definite article. Thus, strengthening our position, Hebrew rhetorical style is in view, not the Hebrew language itself. 
Upon internal examination of Matthew, this becomes obvious. It is why scholars assign a Hebrew audience to Matthew's gospel. Thus, the argument that Papias said Matthew was written in the Hebrew language, but that our Matthew was written in Greek, so Papias must not have referring to the Gospel of Matthew, is frivolous. Ahmed also failed to address how Matthew's Gospel alone mentions Jesus telling Peter to not give offense to tax collectors and to pay temple tax in Capernaum. This is exactly the kind of Jesus tradition a tax collector eyewitness such as Matthew would feel compelled to admit into his Gospel. That the first century material affirms Matthew was in fact a tax collector disciple of Jesus See the following texts. Ahmed did not deal with the we passages in Acts, which show that the author was an eyewitness in conformity with the patristic tradition that Paul's companion Luke wrote Luke Acts. Nor did he address the scholarly refutations of Robbins, etc., who reject the we passages as being eyewitness recollections. In light of Luke being identified as a physician in Colossians 4.14, it's interesting that in the third gospel, we see medical interest where the other gospels do not show it. For example, Matthew 8.14 and Mark 1.30 mention Peter's mother-in-law suffering from a fever. Luke 4.38, however, says she suffered from a high fever. Instead of speaking of a man with leprosy, as Matthew 8.2 does, Luke 5.12 says the man was full of leprosy. That is, his disease was in an advanced stage. Now, writing to Trypho the Jew concerning Luke 22:44, Justin Martyr affirmed the authority of the work, as well as its author being a follower of the apostles, as Luke was. The fact Luke 1:1 1, 1 mentions Jesus' events being quote accomplished among us, means the author was from the same generation as those who walked with Christ. The preposition with the plural pronoun, among us, occurs seven other times in the Greek of the New Testament, according to my count, all with the clear meaning of something being done in the lifetime or presence of the author or narrator. Lastly, again, why would patristics invent the idea Luke wrote Luke Acts, and not instead attribute the work to an actual disciple of Jesus, like Philip or Andrew, if they were just concocting authors. This shows the tradition Luke wrote the work is factual. Ahmed did not deal with the fact that John's Gospel itself internally affirms it was written by an eyewitness of Jesus known as the Beloved Disciple via explicit affirmation as well as the inclusio of eyewitness testimony literary device. Ahmed did not refute the internal arguments made by Bruce, etc., for John son of Zebedee being the beloved disciple author. He did not touch how in the middle of the second century, Justin Martyr quoted John 3, 3 to 5, while a little later in the context, mentioning the quote-unquote gospels and the quote-unquote memoirs of the apostles in the plural. For Justin, these titles applied to both John and Matthew, since elsewhere he said Luke was an example of a document written by those who, quote, followed the apostles. Hence, Justin knew that John's gospel was written by an eyewitness apostle of Jesus. Until Ahmed deals with these kinds of arguments in depth, and there are many more, he's not justified in making sweeping assertions, claiming that we don't know who wrote the gospels. There's a lot he has to contend with first. Next, Ahmed claims the actual authorship titles on early extant manuscripts of the gospels are not original, but instead appear late and were added onto the manuscripts by subsequent manuscript editors. He focuses on Matthew's Gospel here and claims, quote, The earliest manuscript of Matthew, P1, has no title to the top of it, end quote. Yet, P1 is not our earliest manuscript on the matter. Simon Gathercole has shown a flyleaf papyrus dated to the late 2nd century or early 3rd century has the words Gospel according to Matthew in Greek. Ahmed realizes this early papyrus discussed by Gathercole refutes his case, so he briefly mentions it in passing, but then falsely claims the title, quote, was added to the top of it, end quote, as though originally the papyrus did not contain the title. But the title was not added. It's original to that papyrus. 
Gathercole nowhere says it was added later in his two studies. The writing of the title itself dates to the late 2nd or early 3rd century, so Ahmed is being deceptive. The fact is we have a papyrus earlier than or contemporary with P1 affirming that Matthew wrote Matthew. Ahmed paints the picture that the Gospels, with Matthew as a test case, do not have original Gospel titles as represented in the earliest extant manuscripts, but that it took many hundreds of years as well as redactions of said manuscripts in order for the titles to be added. The problem with this picture is we also have P75, which is a late 2nd century or early 3rd century manuscript, and it contains large portions of the Gospels of Luke and John. Lo and behold, it contains the title Gospel According to Luke and the title Gospel According to John. Gather Cole notes there's no evidence these titles were added later by a different hand. They are instead original to the manuscript. Indeed, the evidence suggests the titles share the same hand as the rest of the body of text. Hence, contrary to Ahmed's picture, we do have early manuscripts with original titles and do not have to wait hundreds of more years for them to be added. What is more, Ahmed failed to address Martin Hengel's argument that the titles of the Gospels are a late first century phenomena. Hengel talked about how in ancient book distribution practice, titles were common and necessary. He also argued Gospel authorship ascriptions being broad and undisputed in the relevant patristic literature is accounted for by the hypothesis that the titles were applied to the manuscripts as soon as they began to circulate in the late 1st or early 2nd century. What is more, since there were different Gospels circulating by the end of the 1st or early 2nd century, the titles differentiating them were needed, so they needed to be applied early. Thus, the titles are at the very latest early 2nd century. None of these arguments were addressed by Ahmed. Next, we turn to the topic of textual criticism. Here, Ahmed quotes David Trobisch, stating the aim of the Nessel Allen 28, Novum Testamentum Grece, is not to simply reproduce what the oldest manuscripts like P46 say, but instead to use textual critical methods to arrive at a hypothetical initial text from which all other manuscripts are subsequently derived. There's nothing really controversial about this, though. All it means is that even P46 has variation and needs to be compared with our wealth of other manuscripts and patristics to help come to the initial text using sound text-critical methodologies. Ahmed seems to take issue with the word hypothetical, but that is only employed because we don't have the originals themselves. Well, we don't have the Quran originals either, so it's important to be consistent here. The fact is, text critics work hard with good methodologies to come to what they think was the initial text, but because they don't have the originals, they will therefore cautiously use the word hypothetical in a careful and scholarly manner. The idea that Ahmed wants to perpetuate that we don't know what was originally written is contradicted by the testimony of many scholars. I can cite many textual critics or scholars of the relevant field who affirm that we can uncover the original text based on good text-critical principles. Textual critical techniques are excellent enough tools to allow translation committees and text critics to come to original readings. The best approach to textual criticism is called reasoned eclecticism. It is and was held by most text critics today and of the previous generation. Reasoned eclecticism states we should not prefer any text type over the other, but instead examine both external and internal evidence based on sound principles. What are these external and internal principles? Good summaries can be found in the work of Black and Olland. The external principles are prefer the reading evidenced in broad geographical areas, the one evidenced in the most amount of text types, and the one found in the oldest manuscripts. The internal principles are prefer the shortest reading, the more difficult reading, the reading most consistent with the original author's style and vocabulary, the reading most consistent with the immediate context, the reading most consistent with the original author's broader theology, 
and the reading that is least like parallel passages. This last one corrects the practice of certain ancient scribes who would sometimes harmonize parallel texts in their manuscripts. Once the external and internal evidence is carefully examined, it is quite easy for scholars to dispel variants and uncover the original text. This is what textual critics have worked very hard to do to ensure that we have an accurate New Testament. I can provide many examples of how using these principles makes it quite easy to discern original readings. Ahmed would have to call them all into question in order to argue we can't uncover the original text but he has failed to do so. The fact is, as William Klein, Craig Blomberg, and Robert Hubbard correctly note, based on these text-critical principles, quote, estimates suggest between 97 and 99 percent of the original New Testament can be reconstructed from the existing manuscripts beyond any measure of reasonable doubt, end quote. Ahmed then claims the primitive Christians after Jesus did not believe in inspired New Testament canonical documents, but that such beliefs came much later. So it is important for Christians to understand that a belief in the New Testament itself as the inviolable word of God is a later belief, and so the question begs itself. Are the earliest Christians heretics for not having a New Testament to believe in, or are Latter-day, that is, current Christians, more holy and faithful than the very Christians who knew Christ himself? The earliest generations of Christians did not know of a New Testament and had no requirement to believe in it. However, this matter has been treated at length by Michael J. Kruger in numerous works. Ahmed shows no knowledge of such important studies and therefore fails to interact with them. But he has to if he wants to confidently maintain his faulty position. Second Peter is a first century document and it states Paul's letters were considered scripture. This means that first century Christians held to this belief. What is more, First Timothy, another first century Christian text, cites Luke 10.7 as scripture. What is more, 2 Peter 3.2 gives evidence of Christians in the first century believing in a New Testament canon. The text says, quote, You should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, end quote. As Kruger notes, quote, Given that the reference to the holy prophets is clearly a reference to written texts, it seems that 2 Peter 3.2 brings up the possibility that the teaching given through your apostles may also refer, at least in part, to written texts. In fact, 2 Peter 3.16 refers to a particular example of written texts of at least one of the disciples. Since 2 Peter 3.16 shows that Peter understood some of the apostolic testimony to be preserved in written form, then 2 Peter 3.2 begins to appear like a possible reference to the Old Testament canon and the beginnings of a New Testament canon, end quote. Moving on, we have first century sources affirming that first century Christians were already engaged in public church readings of Christian texts regarded as canon. Colossians 4.16, 1 Thessalonians 5.27, and Revelation 1.13 evidence this practice, and it mimics the practice of Jewish public readings of the Old Testament canon in synagogues. It should also be pointed out that many scholars believe the first century Gospels of Matthew and Mark were written with liturgical structure for the purpose of public church readings. This would again mimic the Jewish practice of publicly reading inspired Old Testament canon in synagogues. The implication is the original New Testament authors were aware that they were writing inspired canonical texts. Lastly, I could mention how the early Apostolic Fathers and Justin Martyr attest to the view that the New Testament documents were inspired. Consult Kruger for all the evidence on that. So these are the kinds of things that Ahmed would need to deal with before he goes around claiming that the earliest Christians did not believe New Testament texts were inspired canon. Next, on the issue of what we can know about the character and sincerity of the original apostles, Ahmed quotes Marcus Bachmuel's assertion that the early sources don't tell us much about Peter 
that many scholars doubt if Peter wrote First and Second Peter, and that the same is the case with Peter's connection to Mark's gospel. But I don't really care for assertions. To take them at face value without doing the hard historical work yourself is being credulous, even if the assertion comes from a scholar. I'm more interested in the actual evidence and sound argumentation. But then Ahmed claims that Bachmuel is a quote-unquote conservative scholar, and so therefore his comments carry more weight. So I have a conservative scholar by the name of uh, Marcus Bachmuel, a conservative scholarship. We need to keep in mind that I have not quoted a single Muslim scholar, a single liberal scholar. However, I engaged in a correspondence with Bachmuel, and he told me that he would not identify himself as a conservative scholar. So Ahmed is incorrect there. Regarding Bachmuel's objections specifically, I agree that we don't have a full biography of Peter from the earliest sources, but this is because he was not the main focus of primitive Christianity. Jesus was. That's why we instead have a full biography of Christ. We do not need to have a full biography of Peter. We know enough important things about him which are sufficient to say much about his sincerity and character. We may not know much about his origins except that he was a fisherman, but the Gospels present him as an impetuous and repentant type of person. His missionary activities are partly treated in Acts and by Ignatius's letter to the Romans, which mentions the labors of Peter and Paul in Rome. Paul also mentions Peter a number of times in his letters, which can be used for biographical information. And Peter's martyrdom is attested in Clement of Rome's first century letter to the Corinthians, which I date between AD 81 and 96, as well as in John 21, 18 to 19. Now, concerning Paul's life, we have quite a bit of biographical information from his letters, Acts, and the Apostolic Fathers. So I fail to understand Ahmed's claim that we don't know much about the character or sincerity of the apostles. I think we do. We have evidence from the New Testament, the early patristics, and even secular historians like Josephus that disciples like Peter, Paul, and James were willing to, and did in fact, die for their beliefs. John the Baptist was murdered for his as well, and he believed in Christ as well as other points of Christian theology as the synoptic tradition affirms. The point is, people don't die for known lies. Thus, this shows at least Peter, Paul, James, and John the Baptist believed what they preached and, in the case of the first three, what they wrote. On the character and sincerity of the original disciples, we also have the weighty testimony of the early apostolic fathers. Ignatius testified that Paul was a holy man. Papias confirmed Mark was a reliable writer when doing shorthand for Peter. Quote, Mark made no mistake in thus writing some things as he remembered them, for of one thing he took special care not to omit anything he had heard, and not to put anything fictitious into the statements." End quote. Papias also affirmed the reliability of the testimony, that is the living and abiding voice, of Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, John, Matthew, and the other disciples. Earlier I mentioned Clement's late first century mention of the deaths of Peter and Paul, but he also confirmed such apostles were illustrious, and he wrote that Peter first, quote, endured not one but many labors. He also confirmed Paul was a good example of, quote, patient endurance, end quote, and that, quote, he had been seven times in bonds, had been driven into exile, had been stoned, had preached in the East and the West, and taught righteousness unto the whole world, end quote. In the early second century, Polycarp affirmed Paul was, quote, blessed and glorified, end quote, and that he, quote, accurately and steadfastly taught the word of truth, end quote. He also stated Paul and the other apostles were obedient and patient people. Bill Craig correctly notes the disciples of Jesus were, quote, simple common men, not cunning deceivers, end quote, and had nothing to gain in worldly terms by proclaiming what they did. So contrary to Ahmed's assertions, a good case can be made 
for the disciples' sincerity and characters. As regards Bachmill's comments on the authorship of 1 Peter, there are dozens of New Testament scholars who argue it was written by Peter. I can provide many commentaries and introductions doing so. Second Peter is a bit more complicated, but quite a few scholars recognize Peter wrote this letter as well. The difference in style and language between 1st and 2nd Peter need not lead to the conclusion that Peter did not write the latter. This is a major reason why many reject 2nd Peter's Petrine authorship. But recognizing the use of different amanuenses being common practice in this period accounts for such differences. With that said, there are nevertheless a good number of scholars who offer evidence for the traditional authorship of 1st and 2nd Peter as well as refutations of arguments against these views. I can think of Schreiner, Big, Jobes, Kruger, Guthrie, I. Marshall, Moo, Kostenberger and Kellerman Quarles, Jean Green, J. A. T. Robinson, Waltner and J. Charles, Carson and Moo, and Blum. After examining both sides, I do not find the arguments for pseudonymity of these letters convincing at all. In fact, there are good arguments against the notion. Concerning Bachmiel's remarks on Peter's association with Mark's gospel, I've already showed the evidence is now so overwhelmingly strong that anyone who merely appeals to secular critics on the matter is doing it a serious disservice. The bulk of evidence needs to instead be dealt with. Again, for the first gospel, we have the device of inclusio of Peter's eyewitness testimony the plural to singular device involving Peter's perspective, Dodd's observation that Mark parallels the preaching of Peter in Acts, Luke's insistence he utilized eyewitness sources in his prologue, taken together with the fact that we know Luke used Mark as a source. Jong Yoon Moon's corroborative evidence Mark was also the amanuensis for parts of 1 Peter, as well as the weighty testimony of Papias, Justin Martyr, and various other internal and external considerations. Instead of just asserting that those who deny a Petrine connection to Mark are correct on the matter, this evidence needs to actually be interacted with. Ahmed knows this, but instead he just makes sweeping dismissals without overcoming the data, a clear example of his deceit. Ahmed then claims that Paul may have endorsed using deceit, quote, according to how one reads Paul, end quote. But the only way you can read Paul as supporting deceit is if you misread him. Ahmed is referring to Romans 3.7's mention of quote-unquote, my lie. The verse says, But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? End quote. However, if one takes the time to actually read that part of Romans, it's very clear that here Paul is engaging a theoretical unbelieving Jewish interlocutor as a way to refute objections against Christian teaching. Quote unquote, my lie is part of the speech of that interlocutor. Scholars point out the hypothetical Jewish objections to Paul's teaching are found in verses 1, 3, 5, 7, and 8a. Paul's Christian answers are found in verses 2, 4, 6, and 8b, and in the ensuing discussion. Because the Quran is incoherent and lacks context most of the time, and Muslims are therefore accustomed to reading religious texts without caring about context, they therefore confuse verse 7 as being Paul's statement indicating his mindset, when in reality it again is a verse which is meant to be read as a Jewish interlocutor's objection to Paul. The best Romans commentators recognize this. For example, Dunn, Moo, Leslie Allen, Schreiner, Longnecker, Hodge, Morris, Kazeman, Gundry, Harrison, Cranfield, etc. How one can then turn things around and make it as though Paul was saying that he was a liar is inexcusable and a prime example of severe Muslim comprehension difficulties. 1 Corinthians 2.14 explains this Muslim blindness by noting that natural unregenerate people cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God, that is, Scripture. The other text Ahmed and various Muslims distort on this matter is Philippians 1.18, which says, quote, What then, only that in every way, whether in honest or dishonest motives, Christ is preached, 
and in that I rejoice, end quote. However, even a basic examination of the context shows that Paul was saying his heretical opponents still mention Christ to others, which is a good thing, despite their dishonest preaching motives. These dishonest preaching motivations consisted of people only evangelizing because they envied Paul, wanted rivalry with Paul, and wanted to afflict Paul while he was in prison. See verses 15 and 17. So, would Paul really endorse this envy, rivalry, and affliction against himself? No. Therefore, he was not, quote-unquote, endorsing their dishonest motives, as Muslims sophomorically claim, but was instead just saying that at least Christ is still being preached, even though all of this nonsense is going on. Now, Ahmed's final argument is a distortion of the words of the 3rd and 4th century church historian Eusebius. Ahmed claims Eusebius appealed to Plato to endorse lying and falsehood. However, Lycona and Habermas have already refuted the misuse of this quotation in a lengthy discussion. Eusebius' quote reads, quote, Plato, but even if the case were not such as our argument has now proved it to be, if a lawgiver who is to be of ever so little use could have ventured to tell any useful fiction at all to the young for their good, is there any useful fiction that he could have told more beneficial than this, and better able to make them all do everything that is just, not by compulsion, but willingly? Truth, O stranger, is a noble and enduring thing. It seems, however, not easy to persuade men of it. Now you may find in the Hebrew scriptures also thousands of passages concerning God as though he were jealous, or sleeping, or angry, or subject to any other human passions which passages are adopted for the benefit of those who need this mode of instruction, end quote. Clearly here, Eusebius was merely affirming that it's okay for God to use anthropomorphic language if it resulted in the benefit of humanity. The problem is the Quran uses anthropomorphic language for Allah as well. Does Ahmed really believe that Allah has literal hands, Quran 373, and a literal throne encompassing the entire heavens and earth? Or will Ahmed affirm Quran 42.11, which says nothing is truly like Allah, and therefore take those passages symbolically? Ahmed needs to be consistent on this matter, and therefore condemn the Quran, if he's going to condemn Eusebius and the Bible for permitting anthropomorphic language. If you carefully read the Eusebian quote in question, Plato did not even encourage lying. Lycona and Habermas correctly summarize that all he said was, quote, He believes he is correct in his belief, but even if he is not, his belief is still expedient, end quote. And all Eusebius said was, quote, The Hebrew writers attributed human qualities to God to explain why we should not worship other gods and the reason behind their laws, end quote. And notice, even in the very quote Ahmed cites, it says those who are willingly just are commended, and that, quote, truth, O stranger, is a noble and enduring thing, end quote. So this idea Eusebius didn't care about truth and was willing to lie to advance the gospel is just something not in the text itself. The fact of the matter is the early church exhorted people to be truthful, be lovers of truth, and to avoid lies and deception. Just as the Old Testament explicitly and consistently speaks against lying and deceit, in Mark 7.22, Jesus names deceit as an evil thing that defiles a person. In Mark 10.19, Jesus commanded his people to not bear false witness. In John 4.24, we read, quote, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth, end quote. In John 14, 6, Jesus said he is the truth. And since Jesus is the truth, the natural application for Christians is we are to be truthful if we want to honor him. In Acts 13, 10, Paul identifies deceit as being demonic. In Romans 1, 29, Paul charges the unbelieving world of things he considers evil, such as deceit, murder, and envy. In Romans 2, 7 to 8, Paul views obedience to truth is that which leads to eternal life. In 1 Corinthians 5.8, Paul promotes the metaphorical unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In 2 Corinthians 6.7, Paul promotes truthful speech 
In 1 Peter 2, 1, Peter commands Christians to, quote, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, end quote. 1 John 1, 6 condemns lying and not practicing truth. And finally, Revelation 21, 8 says liars will burn in hell. I could cite many more texts to refute Ahmed and show that the early Christians clearly valued truth and despised deception. This can also be shown from the early church fathers as well. Now, with all the lies I have caught Ahmed in while addressing his introduction, I think we can all see that he is the true practitioner of deceit. After all, Muhammad permitted him to be deceptive. Muhammad allowed his followers to lie as long as it led to a successful murder of an enemy of Islam. In Sahih Bukhari, we read, quote, Narrated Jabir bin Abdullah, Allah's apostles said, Who is willing to kill Ka bin al-Ashraf, who has hurt Allah and his apostle? Thereupon Muhammad bin Maslama got up saying, O oh, Allah's apostle, would you like that I kill him? The prophet said, Yes. Muhammad bin Maslama said, Then allow me to say a false thing, i.e. to deceive Kaab. The prophet said, You may say it. So the applicatory principle for Muslim polemicists like Ahmed then is that they are permitted by Muhammad to deceive Christians and say false things concerning theological matters, as Ahmed did in his introduction, just as long as such deception results in the spiritual death of Christians and or their conversion to Islam. Those reading Ahmed need to therefore be aware of this overarching deceptive Islamic worldview. There's also the matter of Islamic taqiyya and its various applications which need to be kept in mind when reading the material of Mohammedan apologists. That sums up my rebuttal to part one of Ahmed's introduction. Stay tuned for my response to his second installment once it is made available. Thanks for watching.